So we are beginning. Um, so this is Les. And so you want to tell us a little bit about your purpose and function, Les? Yeah, I'm one of the volunteers for the Voluntary Human Extinction Movement. There's millions of them. I may manage the uh, website and uh, also uh, host information booths and uh, that sort of thing. And this, this is an example of uh, what I do as a volunteer. Yeah, I guess all conversation is a good idea. I'm, I'm um, like-minded in the sense that I don't have much regard for human beings, um, but I have even less regard for nature itself. Um, uh -huh. So, um, you know, there's more targets on my list of let's um, insult a lot of things that need insulting in terms of their uh, poor performance over time, let's say. And uh, so we might agree that human beings have made a mess of having intelligence. Maybe we'd agree because they're basically a selfish monkey and they really just can't get past their own selfishness. They, they can't do the big idea thing. They can't do the vision thing. They can't do for the future thing, obviously. I mean, they have their own children in debt. You know, I mean, that appears to be the problem. Uh, yeah. The lack of empathy causes all of that. You know, we've got the potential, we're just not, it's not happening. Just as a technical um, feature, now I hear the word empathy just because I always have to have these conversations with people about the value of suffering and the value of pain and all this kind of stuff. When mm -hmm. I, I always think, when I say hear the word empathy, I always want to change it to a lack of understanding. Okay. Because empathy is made of understanding first. You have to understand a situation before you can have empathy. And the only reason why animals don't have empathy is because they don't understand. Right. If, a, if a lion could understand that it's causing pain to somebody else's children, it might say, well, I don't want to do this anymore. You know, okay, I'll eat oatmeal. I will. I'll try. <laughs> <laughs> Might I don't know. I, well, I might why, make I, a rational decision. To, well, you know, there's plenty of antelope out there. What's one fewer? Well, well, we know the average human might draw that conclusion, but I'm just saying the the function of intelligence, no matter right. what organism it would be in, we would expect it to have the same effect. So I would I could argue that if Tyrannosaurus got intelligent first, they would be in much distress about their physical formation, and they would say, "Look at us, we're horrible, we're disgusting," and they'd feel terrible that. What do you mean? We, we torture things by function? I mean, this is idiotic. We have to change this. I mean, let's do the pinky drinking tea thing and eating biscuits, and let's not do this horrible torture thing. So I just think, I, I think to presume intelligence wouldn't be able to realize, you know, its own form sucks or is lousy or is inefficient. Right. I think that's the very function of intelligence would be to inform you that your function is insufficient to the purpose. But then our intelligence could also rationalize it so we don't have to worry about it anymore. We go into denial and go, well, it's okay. Yeah, I guess my argument would be is that's not intelligence then. That's um, scheming or that's lying or rationalizing. I mean, r rationalizing, I guess, wouldn't be, in my opinion, a form of intelligence. That would be kind of a form of anti-intelligence. Okay. A form of ignorance, let's say. Uh -huh. Right. A yeah. willful... Ignorance. Yeah, it's a wrong it's a wrong answer and it's a wrong answer for a selfish purpose. Right. So I guess I would say I can't put that in the category of an intelligent thought, that would be in the category of some other kind of thought. It seems like our intelligence is what's gotten us in all this, into all this trouble. Well, just the fact that we've used it, like you said, if we applied intelligence mm -hmm. okay, uh, fairly, um, dis right. with discipline, okay, carefully fail-safe kind of ways, um, always looking to the long-term impact, um, you know, doing the basic procedures that you would say, this is what you do to have a good performing nuclear plant or something, versus, right. you know, Homer Simpson. So, uh -huh. yes, Homer Simpson with the intelligence bomb is dangerous, okay, but let's say Carl Sagan with it might not be so bad. Right. But the end result, we still have that nuclear power plant, so... Well, 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 I'm just saying that theoretically, I guess you could argue yeah. that you could come up with a system that could be fail-safe in the sense that you could make a statistical calculation and say, yes, we have eliminated, we have backed up and redundantized everything so many times that the likelihood of failure is one in one zillion hours or something. Right. So it's just that it'd be very expensive, and we don't want to spend the money. 
would we decide not to uh, continue creating more of us if we were that using our intelligence? Well, I think we already are, right? I mean, the smartest people on Earth are having fewer and fewer children, and the dumber are having more and more children, right? So, I mean, the only people who are sustaining human existence, technically. I mean, technically, you've already won the argument, okay? <laughs> because most people have less than 2.3 children, right? So, 80% of women have less than 2.3. So, it's only that 20% that are creating the whole population bomb. It's only the, 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 the lesser, the, the, there's one group of people that have a lot of kids, and the majority of women have very few, one or two. But even that, the uh, momentum of uh, population growth is so great that even having one is, is too many. The intentional creation of one more of us by anyone anywhere can't be justified today. <clears throat> well, well I, yeah, I would certainly agree with you that we don't have time for doing it slowly. But I'm just saying that technically we're already on a path Yes. If we just stopped the 20%. So I'm just yes. saying the majority of people are already acting as if they understand. We know they don't understand. They're not doing it on purpose. But I'm right. just saying they're already acting as if they understand we're at peak population. Uh-huh. Well, way past peak. Sure, yeah. Way into overshoot. So if we, if we uh, can uh, um, provide reproductive freedom for everyone on the planet, it would go a long way. Is that other 20% that you're talking about? Yeah, yeah, I wouldn't even want it to be freedom. I think we should extort them. I think we should bribe them out of their fertility. You know, so I, I would, I would be more aggressive in realizing that they are, they have a, their stupidity is rather profound, and you're probably going to have to spend some money to get them to do the right thing. You know, uh -huh. You're going to have to bribe them out of it. Possibly so, but when we uh, start making economic incentives, we uh, target a. A demographic that's uh, the poorest people, and uh, in America especially, that gets into ethnic. Uh, the difference, our hist um, institutionalized racism, has caused uh, a larger number of uh, ethnic minorities to be in that demographic. So, yeah, it might be a good idea to pay people to, uh, say, get a vasectomy, but uh, the rich people won't be motivated by uh, by that. Well, like I say, they've already we've already won the argument with them. They're already not reproducing at uh, maintained population rates, so they've mm -hmm. they're already out of the game anyway. They've taken themselves out of the the population game. So, in a sense, like I said, if you just fix the twenty percent over a thousand year period, you would decline in population to nothing if everything stayed the same in terms of the demographics of understanding. So if people remained the same, if they had the same understanding of what they want out of their life, which maybe isn't for kids, mm -hmm. um, you know, you would end up with no population after a thousand years. But obviously we don't have a thousand years to right. play around. Yeah. And each new person is going to have a life that includes a lot of suffering. So it's kind of the antenatalist idea, isn't it? That, uh we shouldn't create another one just to suffer. Yeah, well, that's the our focus. Like I said, I was trying to figure out exactly, you know, we end up with a similar conclusion. We get there yes. through different reasons, right? So it's like yes. you can be a vegetarian because you think it's healthy for you, sure. right? So there's some vegetarians who are health nuts, and then there's vegetarians like me who are suffering nuts. So right. I, I would be in the suffering category, and everything for me is just a suffering equation. So I can't make a distinction between a suffering human and a suffering primate, right. or a suffering wildebeest. So for uh -huh. me, the problem is nature itself. I mean, if you know, I, I was reading in, in your your paper. It said it said natural perfection. Okay, that's a quote from your your writing. And I, I was just a little. I, I'm just saying that's probably a good subject because yeah, I can't find any of that natural perfection. I mean, you know, ten <laughs> using that term. <laughs> huh? I don't remember using that term. That sounds kind of. Oh well, I'll, you, I'll go with that. <laughs> well, well, I'm just saying that it's it's you, there. There's a general tendency in in the theme that is nature's better than stupid humans. Yes. Right. And so, from my perspective, though, it would be that's why I, I I actually turn the word life backwards and and call myself an ethicist now because I'm not just anti-natalist. Right. I'm just not against humans procreating. I'm against all life procreating. It's just a bad news. It doesn't go anywhere good ever. So, our, uh, even though our re end result is the goal is the same, uh, eliminating humans, or you're saying eliminate all life, but uh, you know we're one species out of the entire biosphere. So the reason I wouldn't go that far is to say that uh, 
one species out of tens of millions doesn't really have a place to decide for the rest of them. We can decide philosophically, but to actually do it would be going too far. Well, let's uh, maybe use the analogy. Let's say you're on a bus. Who do you want driving the bus? Mm -hmm. Okay, the imbecile or the guy who actually has worked on buses for 50 years and knows everything about buses? Well, yeah. I mean, we're the smart guys, right? If we leave nature to the dumb animals and dumb oh, forces, I, I mean, aren't we just advocating all responsibility? We're saying, yeah, take the dumbest guy and put him in the seat. Or don't put anybody in the seat. Just say, right, let no. the bus crash, okay? And you're saying that's a responsible duty of a human? No, I'm saying humans have a responsibility to clean this mess up. Well, we do have a responsibility to clean up the messes that we've made, for sure. Yes. Well, I, I mean, I'm just saying a mess is a mess. It really doesn't matter who made it. Okay, if nature made it or we made it, it's irrelevant. There's a mess, and it needs cleaning. And right. I, I, don't, I don't know how you can rationalize thinking about planet Earth without humans and saying, this is a wonderful planet. Okay, I mean, the average sea turtle, we could just use every, I could go through a million different animals and just say, look at the attrition rate. For every adult lion, 10 yeah. cubs are killed. Okay, for every adult sea turtle, 10,000 baby t sea turtles are um, you know, vivisection. For every single, for every octopus, uh, right. 150,000 baby octopi die. It's happening right now in my yard. I've got four robin's eggs, and it looks like only two, uh, only three of them have actually made it, and pretty soon they're going to be cat food. They're, they're taking the worms out of my yard and giving it to the uh, nestlings, but when they become fledglings, They'll probably become food for something else. Well, I'm just saying that the, the amount of torture, quote yeah, unquote, right is now. going on on planet Earth without humans is in, incomprehensibly bleak and horrid. And but, I just don't see how the planet is improved by taking the one animal that can actually understand, the one animal that can actually do something about it, and taking him out of the game first. Well, if if the idea is to reduce suffering, it's pretty hard to quantify suffering, but uh, just as a rough guess, I'd say half of the suffering in the world is due to humans. Of course, all of our suffering is due to yeah, ourselves. Yeah, so that's a, that's a fundamental disagreement we have, because I would be like 99.999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999999
artificially. Well, well, that's another good subject, see, because there's a lot of people, I have this argument in philosophy a lot about whether we project value or project meaning or whether we discover it. So I guess I would argue that we discover, like Columbo, we go to the crime scene and we discover what went happened and that we discover value in the universe. That's a part of the understanding thing. Part of you, empathy is understanding. It's not just a silly reaction. It's a right. reaction based on logically understanding a circumstance. And so uh -huh. I, I would say that we our, our, our decision that there is value happening or there's something bad happening in the universe, let's say the six million Jews in the concentration camp, okay, we can understand that is bad. And it right. can't be something else, all right? right. It just mm -hmm. is bad. There's no rational alternative theory, okay? There's only right. one rational theory, and that is that's not a good thing. That's right. We, we could agree on that. <laughs> yeah, so, so I'm just saying that that's how I would justify jumping into the driver's seat, is right. that I know what's going on on this planet isn't a good thing. If Even if humans aren't here... What's going on in this planet is Jews in concentration camps. There is bad business going on on planet Earth. And that's, what, that's what we can see it as. But, uh, you know, that's our, our judgment of it. Our, <coughs> our subjective uh, judgment. See, see I, I get it, but you're going subjective, and I'm saying, just like the Jews in the concentration camp, I don't think it's a subjective. subjective. I don't think it's a subjective. <laughs> I think it's a fact. Okay, and there's no rational alternative theory, so until there's a rational alternative theory, no, this is a fact, you know, and, and if not acting, is acting. You can always argue, you know, going to a default that is dumb, again, you know what I'm saying, is the same yeah, as right. choosing the dumb answer, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, so not making a choice or not acting is acting. So, how would, what should we do then? Um, should we precipitate a... A, a nuclear war to wipe out life, perhaps? Uh, yeah, well, you do it in whatever the most humane way possible. So I would I would obviously have the voluntary cessation of procreation as the first option, reduce uh -huh. the population substantially, take out all the, the highly sentient organisms first in a graceful as possible manner, and then, yeah, nuke it from space, crash the moon into it, whatever you have to do uh -huh. to turn it back into photons so it can't cause any trouble. So Mars, there's a lot less suffering on Mars than exactly. there is on Earth. Exactly. I use the example all the time. I say, nobody's missing the Martians. Nobody's yes. missing the Venetians, right? And look at what they've gained. No cancer, right? You know, no depression. I mean, they're way oh. ahead of us, right? On all the so statistics, happiness. they're way, way, way ahead of us. <laughs> they don't get to hold a baby and... Oh, yeah, well, that's just, yeah, exactly. Wow, <laughs> yeah. I miss that every day. Like, every day I always have thoughts about I just can't wait to hold a baby. Yeah. You know, right. you know I just can't. So, you know, gee. <laughs> <coughs> Sorry. Well, um, we agree on quite a few things. Maybe it'd be more fun to talk about that part. Like, uh, I saw one of your uh, YouTube Skypes or whatever it was, uh, somebody was, um, oh, oh, the instinct to breed, saying that it's a, a biological, uh, our breeding is biological, and that's only natural. We would follow our biological urges. Well, most, it, it's, it's unusual to hear somebody say, no, it's that we have an instinct to have a sex, and babies come from that, and all species have that instinct. It's not an instinct to breed, it's an instinct to engage in activities that lead to breeding. Yeah, well, I think it's another one of these examples where the game is really a duper's game, you know, or a schemer's game, or a liar's game, right? So nature found out it can manipulate us dishonestly, so to speak, right? I mean, right. The, the evolutionary advantage of procreation, it could create by just creating this little shortcut of let's make them want to do this activity that creates babies, right? right? So it, yeah. did, it didn't make a fair deal with us. It didn't give us a contract and say, here, you want to procreate. No, it just gave us an, a, a, a cheat. You know, it, it, it um, extorted us in a way, manipulated us in a way, with a simple little catch that would create the behavior even though it wasn't our intention. Right. It, it, we wouldn't do it if it <coughs> the function. <coughs> Everything else from the beginning of the first life until now. If it doesn't serve 
Yeah, because especially I think the female animals have really got the ripoff, right? Because I mm -hmm. think they would... I'm sure they have an apprehension about doing that again, right? They might have had the pregnancy, I think, happen and say, I never want that to happen again. Right. But because they're ignorant, they don't know how it happened, so they end right. up having it happen again. So they can't even use their aversion brain mechanism to mm -hmm. avoid it. Even though they want to avoid it, they can't. And that's another one of the rackets of nature, that it doesn't even give them the option to use the facility of their intelligence, you know, when, when it would be, that would be the fair deal, obviously. Right. And humans could do that, too, I would think. Use their brains to decide, I don't want to do that again. Uh, yeah, well, I, I think that's why a lot of modern women do make the decision, you know, it's because they do have the freedom to make the decision. You know, right. and, and that's uh, the substance of it. Some of them have the one kid and they realize, well, I really don't want to do that again. Right. And a lot are, are realizing that they don't want to have any, but, but they have the option of other things. And that, that's why it seems like stupid people uh, don't breed as much as, as smart people. What I think it, what it really is, is people with more opportunities uh, don't breed. and. You know, yeah, I, I, I still argue that it's it's kind of an evil stupidity. The ignorance is so mm -hmm. loud, you know, because there's people in the world who are having kids just to pass on their name. Or they're having kids to farm their farm. Or they're having kids as social security policies or as lottery tickets. They're they're so um, maniacal or, or manipulative, so so selfish, mm -hmm. you know, in the purpose. That I can't give them any, I can't give them any latitude. I'd like to say they're just stupid, but they're right. rotten. They're rottenly <laughs> stupid. By our standards of intelligence, there are a lot of very intelligent people who are wanting to pass on the family name, for example. Yeah, and I'm just saying there's a rottenness to that self-interest. Okay, when you when you expose somebody to harm, or you are neglectful. You know, it's like driving without good brakes in your car or driving drunk. I've used these analogies, but, you know, if you're, if you're playing games with procreation, you can't get much lower than that. I mean, a sloppy Frankenstein? I mean, at least yeah. Frankenstein was a doctor. I mean, he was a scientist. He was qualified, in a sense, to play the game. These guys have no qualifications. They just pick any whore and say, yeah, put my name on that kid. They're a little more selective than that, but, yeah. Yeah, well, I guess what I'm saying is in the third world, it doesn't seem like it's well, much see, more selective yes. than that. You know, I mean, some of these people, I mean, they're killing their female babies, you know, mm -hmm. just because it's of no real value to their namesake right. and their family uh, power. Mm-hmm. For sure. So the status of women in, uh, well, all over the world, there are very few places where you have gender equality. It seems like a... Uh, an important uh, first step in uh, human development. I mean, we're talking about uh, patching up a, a bad job here with uh, any improvements we make on humanity and our uh, social systems. But it seems like on our way out, we do have an obligation to do some improvements. Yeah, I call it graceful exit. And the same, you know, the idea would be to dance, you know, exit stage left in as graceful a way as possible. But yeah, we always should be living. You, you know, like I said, the, really the subject isn't dying. The subject isn't extermination. The subject is valuing. Okay, and so that valuing of the dignity and the the capacity to be harmed of the sentient being affects right. all of these subjects. You know, it affects everything you do every single day. You know, right. our, our relationship with China, our relationship with some South American country that allows its children to go crossing borders and all this other stuff. I mean, all of these issues are related to the fact that you either care about sentient suffering or you don't. So, uh, while we're here and before we can figure out a way to uh, erase life on Earth, uh, what do you think we should do for um, the, the planet or for ourselves or for life? Yeah, well, like you said, it, 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 it's always a hard answer just because we don't have time. You know, if we had time, if we could say, well, we have a thousand years to fix this problem, we well, don't. then you could say, okay, there's lots of plans I have. But when right. you have to do it today... <laughs> You know, mm -hmm. then you start getting radical, and you start saying, "All right, let's make a car bomb or something," or let's, right. you know what I mean? Yeah. You get you get desperate. 
because uh, there's no you don't have time to do it the right way, so you have to do it some kind of you know cheater's way or whatever the thing is to get the job done. So it's always hard, but I'm just saying, you know, of course, there's lots of political solutions. I mean, the whole economy thing is insane. I mean, this whole inheritance thing, billionaires, you know, controlling us. This, I mean, it's all quite uh, unfair and inequitable and nonsensical, and it's a waste sure. of resources. So, you know, I sort of see it as an engineering task, right? You're, we're trying to make a car, and we're trying to make a car that uses as little gasoline as possible and goes as many miles as possible. And so we know what the good and bad things are. We know what the gasoline is suffering. We know what the miles are is the, is the comfort, human comfort. So we want to get the most human comfort, our animal comfort, out of the fewest suffering put in the right. tank. You know, and that equation mm -hmm. can be applied to any political circumstance. And you, you just do this long-term versus short-term. So, yeah, we should be doing all this renewable stuff. Because, mm -hmm. yeah, although it's not very practical today... It will uh -huh. be practical over 20 years. I mean, right. you know, so that's what you have to invest in, is in the future. You can't invest in the people living today. You have to invest in the people living tomorrow. And try not to create more of them. Well, that's the idea, obviously. And to do that, you have to have this strangled conversation with the world. Mm. Um, right. uh, and really what we're having, I mean, from where I'm looking at it is, I have to motivate the people that are already sensitive to the subject, but they won't make a commitment to fixing it. You know, so yes. there's lots of people who are like, you know, they're politically on the right side, but they won't commit to any decision. And mm -hmm. I'm just saying, this is fixable. We know where the problem is. The problem is in the ignorant third world, right? If we educate them and civilize them, they will reduce population. And even if we extort them, we can fix the problem. So let's fix it. You know, let's, but that's fixable. It's doable. But you have mm -hmm. to motivate people in a democratic process to act. So even though we have the majority, the majority won't act. I just had an information booth at a street fair a couple of days ago, and uh, mostly the people who were already convinced were the ones who came to the booth, because it has a banner over it that says, thank you for not breeding, and uh, you know, people who uh, weren't interested in it just kind of passed it by. So most of the time I was um, preaching to the converted uh, and giving them meritorious service award for not breeding and you know, making them feel good about saving 20 acres of potential wildlife habitat because that's our footprint. So, and uh, somebody said that uh, what we really needed to do was uh, give vasectomies where they're needed the most. And I suggested the balls would be the best place, but he meant uh, India and South America. Uh, yeah, I don't know if vasectomies are the solution, obviously, because it's like a, you know, it's like a feral cat problem or a feral de or deer problem or something else. It's the does that produce the babies. And so, you know, one rogue male can impregnate a thousand women, so you well, got to snip them. Well, well, I'm just saying you can't getting the male snipped isn't going to fix the problem. I'm just saying that oh, you, know, you know what I'm saying. It's a, it's a reproductive issue. It's always it's always 100 times more. Well, not 100 times. That's an <laughs> exaggeration. But it's 85 percent more effective to sterilize a female than to sterilize a male, because uh, one one yeah. fertile male. Okay, can just spoil all of your efforts. You leave one fertile male behind, and it's like Adam and Eve, right? You just broke the game. They'll they'll just do it all over again. You're you're assuming that guy is going to be able to get it on with. Uh, with well, that I'm just saying we know that that's usually the game, right? We know the guy who didn't get snipped is probably out there trying to do just that, and even if he isn't, he just doesn't care. Okay, but we know he's probably a casual sexer, and he's probably somebody who you know, can love him and leave him. Okay, so I'm just saying the odds are he probably is going to be one of those guys who is just going to try to get one night stands and he's going to try to have as many women as possible and he's just going to be a nightmare. I, I just mean that as a practical matter. I, yes. I, I would subsidize female reproductive sterilization more than male reproductive sterilization. If you look at uh, humans as a like a herd species, it would make a lot of sense. But you can sterilize ten men for the cost of one woman. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm just saying that. I just think the. I don't think it has to be that bad to tell you the truth. I don't think the exp like especially the, the the implanted hormones and different things that are pretty cheap. Um, they just have to be maintained every three years. Um, but you know, I'm just saying we can give women devices that are pretty effective. Um, you know, and and uh, you know. 
I, I'm just saying that I think we have to we have to concede that the women have the babies, and that's real. They're the oven, and we got to break the ovens. They do have them, but there's a guy behind every one of those. Uh, it's, uh, <laughs> I, I see what you're saying that one guy, you know, twenty billion sperm can. Well, well, I mean, in Chinese history, right? I mean, Attila the Hun or whatever the guy's name was. Right. You know, they say he wiped out all the other males, basically killed all the other males. And, you know, he is, his genes are in 25% of the Chinese population now. I mean, at, at one point, he was the father of, you know, one out of five babies or one out of four. Right. Which is like an incredible, um, you know, an insanely... Uh, you, you know what I mean. It'd be hard to pull that off today. Yeah, yeah, it certainly would be. <laughs> but I'm just saying that's the threat of one male. <laughs> a lot of guys might like to try, but... Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's the, that's yeah. all I'm saying is is the like to tryers can really make a mess if you don't do mm. something, you know. You have to have a backup plan, I guess is all I'm saying. <sighs> yes. Cover all the bases if possible. Absolutely. Oh, so we probably, we just, we generally agree. Um, Whatever it takes. But I, I still like to get back to this, you know, again, you're, you're saving natural and spaces or environment. And again, that would be such a nothing argument to me. Like if I, if I came to your booth and you said to me, oh, you just restored to natural richness, you know, an acre of rainforest. You know, and I'd say, well, yeah, that's great for the greenhouse thing and all that crap. But all those animals are now eating each other. And it's just a fucking blood bath. Oh, sorry. Uh, you know, a blood bath. Why, why, yeah. do I have, why should I feel good about that? I'd rather have it at, covered in asphalt. That's a... Uh, that's the way you'd look at it, and I'd look at it different. So uh, is it a matter of which one of us gets to drive the bus? What, what happens? Like, I don't, I don't know if uh, humans are in the place... There, there, and there is no driver. Well, I guess I guess what I'm saying is, is if I if I let you drive the bus, okay, yeah. and Planet Earth goes on for two billion more years, you know, right. rich and green and full of blood, um, right. I completely lost. Okay, yeah. everything I care about just got is in the concentration. Ca I totally lost the war, right? I mean, I just totally lost if that happens from my perspective, because right. humans, from my perspective, are just a tiny fraction. They're, they're just a thin veneer of the problem. Right. Whereas I see it as the, the goal. You know, I, um, it, there are a lot of different uh, reasons that people are in uh, voluntary human extinction movement, and uh, a lot of them are to preserve what's left of the biosphere. And of course, that wouldn't be your purpose. Uh, yeah, it's just a, it's an interesting problem that we run into just because, like I said, I have this with the vegetarian issue, you know, because you're almost right. like sometimes Thanks. sometimes the health nuts get irritating, you know, because they're okay. making arguments that have nothing to do with the subject, mm -hmm. you know, or it's even being an ultra vegan or something. It almost They're almost turning it into a religion, and you get to the point where you're saying, you're making us look like a religion, okay? It's about yeah. sentience, you know what I mean? It's not about some spiritual karma stuff, so yeah, uh -huh. that's fine that you want to believe that, but if you go selling the idea based on that, you're just going to make us sound like religious nuts. Mm -hmm. And I guess I'm not impugning you with it, I'm just saying that oh, no. you're no. a little bit of a Gaia nut, in the sense that uh -huh. you think a green earth is a happy earth, where I'm uh -huh. like, no, asphalt, asphalt, <laughs> yeah, let's echo with asphalt. It's true. You go out to the asphalt. There's not much uh, suffering going on there. Uh, well, it does minimize it. <laughs> <laughs> I just don't think it's our call. But otherwise, you know. I, well, I know, but who's calling if we don't call, right? I mean, Nobody. that's that, that's the only question I'm saying is, is why would you re yeah. why would you revert to a default? Where, like, say you have a very important decision. Okay, button A, button B. Really important difference in the outcome, right? Mm -hmm. And you're saying, well, it's not my place. Right. But something's going to press the button, like a fly is going to land on it, or somebody's <laughs> going to roll Yahtzee dice on it, or, you know, I mean, some random event, so to speak, random in whatever that word means in a deterministic universe, but you know what I'm saying. Some sure. non-deliberate event is going yep. to happen, and a button's going to get pressed. So if you don't press it, it is going to get pressed. Okay, you're just saying you're not going to apply your intelligence to the choice. 
And that's where I'm like, no, you got to you you <laughs> got to apply intelligence wherever possible. You can't let in, you can't let stupid things run things. You can't let stupid things drive things. You always have to fix it if stupid's in control. If if there's if there's something in control anyway, or it, you know, if things are just happening as they happen. Okay, well, so you're leaving some door, like a crack open for, like, there is something better than you. There's something smarter than you somewhere in the universe that might be making the decision to create life. No. That, uh... No, that, I don't see that as, as a possibility, that there's any uh, entity making decisions. This just is something, life is just something that happened. I know, but you're saying that, that the fact that it happened, although it might look bad to you, you're going to assume it's none of your business. And that's the part I don't understand. Yes, right. Why is it none of your business? Because I see us as one in 10, 20 billion, million. I, I know, but if we're saying dumb processes replicated the first cell, let's say it's just a dumb right. freaking process. Why should the dumb process decide... The, to torture animals for four billion years, I mean, well, 500 million. 500 million years of yeah. sentient life on Earth, right. okay? So a dumb molecule decided to torture sentient animals in a, in a meat grinder for 500 million years, and you're saying because it was here first, its, its authority is, I won't step on its authority. And I'm saying, why wouldn't I step on its authority? It's a friggin' molecule. It's stupid. DNA molecules don't deserve respect. I'm not going to listen to it. I'm going to throw a tomato at it. Yep, I can see your point. Okay, well, I'm, I'm not saying you can't see it. I guess I'm just trying to see your point. And I guess I'm just saying, this is why I can't see your point, is that I would be desperately trying to get to that driver's seat. I guess I'm too much of an anarchist and think that things should uh, go along as they. Uh, as yeah, they I, I, I'm, I'm almost anally the opposite way in the sense that I have no. I hate chaos. I hate anarchy. I hate the wordy. The word even grates on my senses. <laughs> it's obnoxious to intelligence. You design things that are good need to be deliberately designed, carefully engineered. Okay, the Empire State Building's a rock-solid piece of engineering. You know what I mean? They did it right. You do things right. You don't do things haphazard and sloppy and just let some idiotic, stupid circumstance decide people's fate. Uh-uh. If you can control fate, control it with intelligence. Use logic wherever possible. Possibly so. Okay, well, I'm just saying, I'm just explaining <laughs> that that's a kind of a personality difference is that there's nothing relaxed in me or casual in the sense of just letting things happen because things, I just, just I guess, I guess it's, I've always, I've, I've been like a mechanic my whole life fixing things and I just know this is what happens when people don't pay attention is when things break. You know, right. and when thing, people don't maintain it is when it breaks. So this is stuff you have to be aware of, the mechanical function, and the function has to be maintained, and the function has an engineering and an efficiency, and that you can fix the efficiency. You can make things better. Sometimes you can fix it. Yes. You know? I just don't think of nature as a machine. Yeah, I think of it as, you know, uh, just the dumbest... You know, I mean, it's a machine that's obviously just a stupid machine, right? Like, so, okay, yeah. precious things in... Um, horror out. Okay, I mean, it's like, it's a diamond grinder. It grinds up diamonds and produces, you know, manure. I mean, it's it's a stupid machine. Mm -hmm. You know, suffering, it just creates suffering. It's what it creates in the end. Wasted suffering. You know. It looks like it. It looks like a lot of suffering. Yeah. Do you, do you spend much time out in um, the wilderness at all? Have you gone out to... Well, most of my life, um, I don't. I, I, you know, in my youth, I went to all the places. You know, Yellowstone and the Tetons uh -huh. and the Redwoods and the Geysers and the this and the that. So I've been yeah. all to those places, and I have. I've always had some sort of connection. Um, I used to take care of animals and all that kind of stuff. People, you know, I was a nature boy kind of person. People call me Tarzan, all that kind of stuff. Uh -huh. So I've always, and and right now, I live, you know, in the woods, and you know, I, I'm, you know, I, I, I rather nature than people. But I still, um, 
you know, I've always had a, I, 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 from a very early age, I realized that nature is a cruel engine. You know, mm -hmm. that it, you know, it made crocodiles, you know, yeah. I mean, it just doesn't care about me, okay, and it doesn't care about anything else walking around here, and it will just use us up to make molecules. <laughs> it, it does, uh, well, molecules with life, with the life force, it's a little different than just... <laughs> well, uh, life force, is a, you know, that's another kind of a religious kind of word, force, but I'm just saying that it's... You know, life is just a replicate. You know, I call it consumption, reproduction, cannibalism, addiction. And those are the ingredients. And they're all lousy ingredients. You know, it's an island planet, so the life started eating its own family. You know, it's it's just that simple. You know, it's... it's it, it, You know, it's just invidious. I mean, mm -hmm. everything is essentially born as a parasite. You know, it has to exploit something to make its living. It has to mug something and steal its star energy, you know. Well, some of them are mutualistic, but... but well, yeah, I'm just saying, that's, that, that's just a, you know, yeah, that's just the, that's almost like the all the, the mature marriage, right? Yeah. Yeah, you know, it's just a weird contract of, you know, over time, we've figured out how to eat each other's poo. <laughs> you know, it's... it's <laughs> You know, so it's still a parasitical relationship. It's just that you've taken the edges off of it and made it interdependent, you know. But, you know, we know where it came from. You know, it always starts as a parasitic relationship. It always starts as sucking somebody's blood, so to speak. Yeah, the ideal is given back, but yeah, you're right. So do you uh, try to convince people that, uh, that they shouldn't breed or that they should... Um not create more domestic animals, or yeah, I I, I do that. I mean, I, it seems like inferred in everything I talk about. But oh, yeah. you know, I'm saying it's like I'm, I don't exactly say to people directly informing them, just because I assume them to have a little bit of intelligence. So I say, well, look, there's this value equation, you know, and uh -huh. you really have no right to play Dr. Frankenstein, and that's what procreation is. Procreation okay. is playing a game with something else's welfare. Okay, mm -hmm. and you don't have an insurance policy, right? You have no insurance for when it goes wrong. How are you right. going to clean it up? There's no undo button. Okay, no. so if the whole thing goes hideously wrong, what are you going to just say? My bad? And that's enough? That's good enough? Well, it's not good enough, okay? Right. You don't have consent. You got no business. When you don't have consent, you have to be perfect. That's one of the arguments I've been making lately. Mm -hmm. You know, when you don't have something's consent, if I steal your mortgage money, you know, or something, I steal something, you know, your house deed, and I go gambling in Las Vegas, I better be sure I'm going to win or I have no right to do it. So unless I'm absolutely certain I'm going to win, I have no justification for risking your welfare. Right. And you can't be sure. Exactly. So that's just the game. So until you perfect your life game, you have no right to force somebody to play it. The uh, That's sort of Benatar's... Uh anti or asymmetrical uh, pattern. Yeah, well, I've, I've defended Benatar's asymmetry a lot, you know, in videos. Done a lot of videos about rephrasing this idea of the, you know, not bad idea. You know, the right. not bad being a good by default. You know, uh -huh. when you have a not bad, you uh, it's automatically a good. A not bad right. is a good. You know, you just can't avoid that fact. Right. And, you know, that's the substance of the asymmetry is essentially just realizing that not bad is win. You know. It's interesting to see people trying to refute that. I, I was reading uh, Christine Overall's uh, Why Have Children? The Ethical Debate. And uh, she was trying to uh, say that it was like if uh, there's a poison M&M in the bag and yet there's hundreds of good ones, would that stop you from reaching in? You know, these analogies break down in a hurry. That's, that's not yeah, at all. Yeah, well, that's the joke of it, right? Because yeah. my answer would be yes. Okay, I mean, I don't want an M&M &M bad enough to risk, uh, like, malaria or something. Like, one malaria M&M right. &M or one uh, elephant man. I become the elephant man if I pull that bad M&M for an M&M? &M? Yeah, I'm not doing it, okay? you got to have something a lot better than M&Ms. Right. <laughs> and I would argue that the average person's ambitions are so silly. You know, their ambition right. is, I want something to love me uh, unconditionally. I need yes. unconditional love. You know, I, I have to have a child to can unconditionally love me. Like, that's a logical concept. Like, somebody should actually unconditionally love something. 
No, I guess if you're going to love something, it should be conditional. They shouldn't be axe murderers. They shouldn't be selfish, <laughs> awful monsters. You know, they should actually earn your love. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean... They, Mom still loved the axe murderer. You know, they're just she, so... You know, that's just so ignorant. And you're just like, is. wow. And it's so excited because people don't... People think I'm going to have a baby or I'm going to have a child. But they're not. They're going to have an adult. Eventually, if things work out... Exactly. It's it's going to be a, a full human being with, and it's going to die, and it's going to do all of these things you haven't even done yet. So here, here I haven't even died yet, and I'm going to assume that it's okay, that the experience is going to be just fine, and I can impose it on somebody else. I haven't even done it yet, and I'm going to impose it on somebody else. I mean, that's kind of rich, right? You've never, <laughs> you've never jumped out of an airplane. <laughs> yeah. And yet you're going to assume that you know what it is, even though you've never done it. Well, you can't know what it is until you do it. That's one of the uh, the arguments for... <coughs> well, I mean, it would be certainly one of the arguments you could make is that you have no right to procreate until you've played the whole game. Right. So, yeah, That's... you can't procreate until you're dead. Okay, yeah, so, so, so put your seed away, and then after you're dead, you can procreate, because you can't, right. but you can't do it while, until you do the whole game. <laughs> there, there was somebody debating you who said that uh, his life was really good, and uh, he, his children were also having a really good life, and, and uh, you'd said, well, yeah, uh, turn, uh, Fukushima operated great. For, for a long time, and then all of a sudden it didn't. So you're saying that that whole time was worth it? I thought that was a pretty uh, profound uh, comeback on that. And, and as Benatar points out, you know, we remember things a lot. I mean, his life can't have been roses the whole time. He's 50 years old. This can't happen. Yeah, I guess that's part of the psychology of it is that, you know, how a mind works, because my mind was always risk averse. You, you know, I mean, my whole attitude was always kind of... I wasn't a shiny, penny kind of guy. I mean, you couldn't just seduce me with, <coughs> you know, some simple... We're going to go somewhere and do something, and it's going to be great. I'd uh -huh. say, well, where, what do you mean it's going to be great? Explain to me what it is we're going to do first, so I know what I'm in for, and I'm not too sure your judgment is all that great, so you saying it's going to be great, well, bungee jumping isn't going to be great for me, so no, let's not do that. You know, so I was always more risk averse, and that's sort of the irony here is that this part of this is this psychology. You know, some people are just so compulsively living, you know, for yeah. their ambition. Their ego <laughs> is so strangled. They need to accomplish, they need to have, they need to get somewhere. You know, and other people are just saying, no, I just don't want my flowers to die, and I don't want my house to burn down, and I don't want the lawn to die. And I don't, you know what I'm saying? They're just trying yeah. to keep what they got. You know, mm -hmm. and, and they're appreciative of what they have. And they really don't want the gravy and the desserts and the, you, you know, they don't need the shiny city on a hill. They mm -hmm. just need a reliable roof over their head. That's not how humans operate generally. We're always striving for more. That's how we've gotten to where we are today. Yeah, well, I guess I'm just explaining why this subject is always difficult for me because I didn't have to be convinced. You know, no one had to make the argument to me. Mm -hmm. I just observed it from living that, right. you know, this is, this is no way to do anything. This is no way to run a railroad. Right. But everybody's doing it. <coughs> yeah, well, of course, that, you know, yeah. <laughs> you know, you go back to your mother. If everybody's running off a cliff and, you know, does that mean you should do it? You know, and then, you know, that's always the duplicity, right? When they're, when it's... When it's what they're for, then you're supposed to do it because everybody else is doing it. And then when it's what they're against, you're not supposed to do it because everybody else is doing it. Yeah. Now, never appealed. <sighs> you know, and never the standard shouldn't be that they should have to logically justify it. Because that's another thing I sort of, I sort of play a game with is I, I ask people to give me one paragraph explaining why you're entitled to have a kid. Just write one paragraph explaining and don't use the word I want. Okay. <laughs> Use some other ex explanation for why you're having a kid besides I want. For the sake of the child to have the, all the experiences that we have. <clears throat> yeah, well, I'm just saying that that would be as, as, as easily defeated by the, well, what if he has muscular dystrophy? Then it's not the experiences you had, is it? Right. It's some other experience, so you really don't have control over that, do you? So that doesn't work, you know. But I guess, but, you know, good effort.
Uh, you know, I'm just saying that they, that yeah, minimum, right. they won't even do the, they, you know, at least you tried to answer, you know, they don't even answer, most people. I can't even get them to do it. No, no, it's, uh, in fact, there is the fallback. It's like some things you just aren't logical. They're just, you know, they're beyond that. They're more spiritual and, and uh, so on. In other words, I haven't a fucking clue as to what, why. I just want to do it. Yeah, so, yeah. well, it's that whole selfish thing versus, you know, like I said, an I want just can't. In, in the context of the game we're playing, Lifeboat, you know, we're playing Lifeboat, I want just doesn't work on a Lifeboat. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? You have to appreciate that all the other people are going to be affected by what you want. Right. You, you know, and it's just, it's, it's disappointing that people can't even get that little bit of philosophical depth. You know, where they even recognize they're on a lifeboat and the other guys on the lifeboat want to live too. Mm -hmm. That's the understanding or yeah. empathy that we started out with. Exactly. One of the ways that I uh, have tried to uh, bring this out is to uh, ask what the percentage of uh, likelihood that uh, civilization uh, will collapse within the lifetime of a person uh, born today if we don't make changes. And most people say it's a pretty high chance that it won't survive very long, the way we're going. And then it's what are, what are the odds that we will do whatever's necessary to keep that, to change? And those odds are fairly low. And then what, how, uh, how great would the odds have to be that, your, that a person created today would not suffer horribly in the future? If, you know, adding those three things up, Probably, if people were making a logical decision, would say, "Well, yeah, the odds are against it." Yeah, it seems yeah. all pretty bleak. I mean, obviously, it's a it's a horrible equation because even us, we are we we have a certain unwritten agenda, which is changing people so radically that they would be capable of creating a good world. You know, you know what I'm saying? If you get you know, if yes. you get people to all voluntarily go extinct then you've actually created human beings that probably will be worth saving. It's you, true. You know, it's so that's paradox. the irony of it, is that, it you know, is. that that's the dilemma we're in. But, I mean, clearly, right. you know, I see it as the dystopian thing. We're not going to just die off. Right. We're going to die slow and hard. You know, AK-47, gang war, mm -hmm. you know, nuclear poisoning. You know, it's going to be a horrible, or horrible, unlikely. horrible world we're going to be sentencing those people to live in. Quite likely. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, really, sure. it's really important not to fail that way. Right. You know what I mean? Failing is okay, but don't fail catastrophically, you know. And it seems the human race is bent on doing exactly that. Let's just see if we can fail as bad as possible. Yes. Yeah. You know. We're doing it. Yeah. The, uh, at the uh, information booth that I had, I have a sign that says "Visualize Voluntary Human Extinctions." People often read things out loud as they go by, and I say, "Well, it's better than the involuntary human extinction, don't you think?" It, it, it helps them engage in the conversation. Like, yeah, I guess so, because I think people are mostly aware that what we're doing is bringing about some pretty horrible changes, even though you know mostly they deny it because they have to in order to to live. Yeah, well, it's sort of an obvious. A circumstance. I mean, the, the 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 universe is going to consume the Earth eventually. Okay, the universe is going to consume well, all the matter. It's going to particulate it all. There'll be no remnant, not even a tiniest of remnants left behind. It's all going to be um, thermodynamically consumed. So, and, and all you're doing is saying, well, well, should you die gracefully or should you die badly? Should you leave that last generation hanging? Or should you help them out? Should you let people die of slow heat death? You know, where the planet gets too hot over a hundred year period and they all die in a miserable exposure kind of way in a bleak, horrible world? Or should you just do this gracefully? <laughs> You're so negative. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, well, that's, that's all there is, to tell you the truth, <laughs> right? I believe in negative and less negative, right? right. I mean, there's a whip and less whip. But, there, but there's no, there really isn't any carrots. The carrots are, you know, like the Matrix says, there is no carrot, right? Like there's no spoon. Well, there's no carrot, okay? No carrot. It's just whip and less whip. <laughs> but we can believe there is and fix it, okay? Well, well, I give people the option. I'm saying yeah. I can argue, I can argue either way. 
I'm just saying that if I'm going to be philosophically honest, that's how invidious nature is, <laughs> it, that it didn't even give us real carrots. It right. just takes away the whip. We're such slaves that we say we win when the, the master isn't whip is as hard today. I won. I didn't get whipped as hard today. I mean, that's what we're doing. And it's just, wow, that's really fail, right? I had a great day. I got whipped less. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you know. That's true. That's how we look at it. That's how we get through life. So. Yeah. Well, we have just about filled up an hour. Yeah, I think we did good. So maybe, maybe we can do this again and, uh, you know, keep in touch anyway and see what kind of responses you get and I get from people and arguments and, you know, I'm for yeah. it anyway, you know. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, so good. Convinces good. we're wrong. Yeah, I'll say, say good work to you and uh, keep up the good work. And Thank you, you um, too. Uh, I certainly appreciate it, even, even though it's... it's a little bit wrong-headed. It's okay. Of course, just, yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, really, thank you very much. It was really a, a very nice hour. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Take care. Take care.